What's up, everybody? Welcome to another ML Ops community meetup. We are doing it big today. We've got none other than Andrew Jones coming at us from Go Cardless. I'm going to give him a proper introduction as you who have been here before know this is no ML Ops community meetup if there is no bad musical introduction. So here we go. I'm about to get into it. Hope you all are having an incredible Wednesday wherever you are in the world. Feel free to let us know where you're coming in from. I'll be monitoring the chat just a bit and I look forward to seeing where everybody's dialing in from it's always nice to see that so drop it in the chat let us know and uh let's do this musical intro huh first let's shut off the nice sounding music and now we get to go to <laughs> me and my guitar all right hopefully you all can hear this yeah i'm gonna guess I'm going to guess there is a yes. Andrew, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear it? So this is how I get to serenade you, Andrew. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. All right. Does anyone have a key that they would like me to play in? Anybody interesting keys that we want to go in? So speak now or forever hold your peace. Jones is the tech lead at Go Cardless. Andrew is a senior data engineer and group tech lead working across data infrastructure and ML enablement to build the best in class infrastructure and services to power analytics models and data driven products today Today he's gonna talk with us about that hype dog. New term you've probably been hearing all about. It's called data contracts. And I'm so pumped to hear how we can drive ML data quality with data contracts andrew thank you for coming on the ml ops community meetup it's great to have you here <laughs> you didn't know what you were getting yourself into did you you did not realize what was coming <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's awesome, man. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm tech lead at GoCarless. I'm working across the data infrastructure and machine learning enablement teams. And today I want to talk to you about how we're using so I call data contracts to improve our data quality. So just briefly on GoCarless, in case you haven't heard of us before. Um, so we're a fintech based in London. Um, kind of specialising in recurring payments and bank-to-bank -bank payments, uh, typically via direct debit, but more recently also via open banking. Um, some of our big customers include people like DocuSign, Klarna, Guardian, people like that. Um, but also, particularly in the UK, you use us without realising it when you pay your energy bills or, or gym membership or, or things like that. Um, although we're also now operating in many countries around the world. In terms of how we use ML Go Cardless, we have three key models. First one is an internal fraud model, which, you know, as you expect, being a sort of fintech and financial company, it's quite important that we try and protect ourselves from being defrauded. Um, 
we also have two more models that are used kind of as part of our product and kind of sell to our customers. One is called Success Plus, and this is all about um, when a payment fails, trying to diligently try it at a time it's most likely most likely to succeed again in the future. Another one is called Protect Plus. So this is about protecting our merchants from being defaulted for themselves. So the way we work at GoCardless is, so we have our customers, we call merchants, so you know, people like Klarna, um, and they have their own customers who we call payers, and they pay the merchants. So Protect Plus is about protecting our merchants from being defaulted by people acting as their customers, and our internal fraud model is about us being protected from people acting as merchants trying to fraud us as a company. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting there is that we're using ML in sort of many places and in increasingly important places. You know, obviously fraud is important being a financial company, but also we're selling ML-driven models, ML-driven products to our customers and using it as a revenue driver, using it as a, as a differentiator, um, trying to build defensiveness into our product, kind of relying on our data, data that only we have to build these kind of products. Um, so clearly, these models are important to us and data is important to us. But, and this probably won't be a surprise to anyone, like data is critical to a model's performance. Like, you can't build an effective model if you don't understand data, if you don't trust the data, if you can't rely on the data. So this is what I'm going to talk about, um, go focus on in, our, in this talk today. So where does that data come from for these models? Well, this is what our data architecture looked like sort of a year or two ago. Um, it probably looks familiar to many of you as well today. So we have upstream databases, uh, which our services write to. We're using Postgres in most of those. And we've, we've developed a change data capture or CDC service. And what that does is it kind of like tracks all the events, all the changes that happen in the database, sends them through into PubSub and into BigQuery. When using those events in BigQuery, we can recreate the Postgres database like in its entirety. So we have in BigQuery, which is a data warehouse, we have an um, entire copy of database, of Postgres database, same structure, same schemas, same records, same everything. We then do a lot of transformation and joining of our data uh, using tools like Airflow and DBT. And eventually we get something that's kind of hopefully useful, but hopefully can drive our analytics, so I look at dashboards, revenue numbers, things like that, and also drive our features, which end up driving the models. So like I said, this architecture probably looks familiar to many of you, and probably the problems sound familiar too. And the main problem is that changes in the upstream database, in the Postgres database, negatively impact our downstream consumers. So typically that'll be a scheme of change being the most obvious one, so when a schema change happens, um, often uh, we rarely get told about it in advance. A schema change happens, and the next morning our ETL is broken or our feature transformations are broken. And then we, as consumers, have to go in and try and work out like what has changed, how has it changed, who changed it, and more often than not just work around it, you know, like if null in or some kind of case statement and try and work around the schema change. And this results in this pipeline be then unreliable, um, which obviously is not good if you're trying to use this data to drive important models or important analytics. Apart from the reliability, there are other problems with this data. And that's why ultimately we feel this is poor quality data to build upon. Those other problems include lack of documentation. So really to use this data, you need to know a lot about the upstream service. Like there's no documentation, um, there's no ownership of different tables. So to use it, you have to like learn about the service, how it models the world, you have to try and work out how to talk to, typically asking on Slack, you know, being redirected, ask someone else, ask someone else. And so eventually you find out enough about the data that you can actually start using it to drive your transformations, drive your feature transformations or your DBT transformations. So once you do have understanding, it really takes a lot of effort and cost to actually do that transformation, do that joining. Apart from kind of time and effort and sort of monetary costs it takes to do that, this just further increases the further increases the unreliability of the of the pipeline as a whole. You've added a lot more complexity into the pipeline, 
a lot more logic into the pipeline, stuff that could change over time without, again, without you knowing about it. And this pipeline gets ever more unreliable. And the root cause of this is that the data was not built for consumption. It was built for, um, for the needs of upstream service. It's built for a transactional database. It might more than slightly really depend on how that service needs to perform. It's not built for consumption. Those generated data don't really know has been consumed. We're not thinking about how it's consumed. We're making the scheme changes, making the data changes. Yeah, it just wasn't built for it. And ultimately, that leads to our data scientists and other consumers spending too much time pairing, understanding, transforming that data, not enough time sort of doing feature engineering or tuning models or actually doing data science. And that was a problem for us. And we kind of hear about these problems over many years, hearing the same sort of problem. And we start thinking, there must be a better way to do this, right? Like, this can't be it. So what can we do to improve the quality of data? And can we do it at source, not in the pipeline, not adding more and more logic in there, more and more complexity in there, kind of building other architectures in our data warehouse? Can we really improve quality of data at source? Um, so let's see how we can do that. Well, first of all, we need to work out uh, what is good quality data. And for us, we think good quality data is data that is documented, it's discoverable, you know where to find it, you know how to understand it. Um, you have to rely on asking people in Slack or kind of institutional knowledge from people who've been here a long time and can explain to you, you know, what data is, how it's evolved. Um, it should be documented, it should be discoverable. We want good quality data to be versioned. So we understand data changes over time, and that's fine. We don't discourage that. But when it does change, particularly if it's a breaking change, we want there to be a new version of data. And we want some kind of migration path to that new version that allow us to move over to that new version without breaking everything sort of downstream, without breaking our models, without breaking our analytics. Ultimately, what we really want, and what's concerned with good quality data, is that it's reliable. We want to be able to build it with confidence, because if we can't, how can we build our models with confidence and deploy those into business or to our customers with confidence? And ultimately, we believe good quality data is the responsibility of those producing the data. So, you know, they know about data the best, it's their data, they know how it's evolved over time, they know what changes they want to make in the future. It's their responsibility to produce data of good quality that we can consume. And we started thinking about this, and we started thinking, well, it sounds a bit like an API. Like, so I've got more of a software engineering background than a data engineering background, moved data engineering more recently. And if I was thinking about how two services would consume, sort of produce and consume uh, data, it would be via an API. Um, we'd never give another service access to an internal database and expect that to work, expect that to be okay. We know that will break over time, it'll be brittle, we know it'll be... Um, unreliable, so we create an API, and that API will provide an explicit interface between my internal models, my internal database, and what I want to provide for consumption. So we want the same for data. We think we should have the same for data. Think about an API as well, it's fairly stable, but it's the ability to evolve over time. So to take an example, if you look at, like, say, the Slack API, people build businesses on top of that, and they can be really confident that they're not going to wake up one morning and see that their, their, you know, their, their, their solutions or their tech or whatever they built on this Slack API is broken. Um, you know, it's fairly stable. It's well documented. As long as you're using it within the documentation, as the documentation tells you to use it, you know what you're going to get from it. And that's what we want data too. And with Slack, like, if I'm going to decide things to change the API, by creating a new version, that'd be a migration path, or like say six months where you can move over to it. So you as a consumer can move over to it in your own time without breaking things with dash and consumers. Again, we think we should have that for our data too. And if you about an API, you can often refer to it as a contract between sort of provider and consumer. And a contract might have other things in it like SLOs and SLOs, or sort of kind of support levels and sort of other guarantees like that. Again, we should have the same for our data. 
And this idea of a contract kind of stuck with us and we kind of liked the word. And that's how we come up with what we call data contracts. So what exactly is a data contract? Well, it's how we define the data. So it's a schema. It's how we describe the data. So it's documentation and the like. It's how we decide which data to expose. So really moving away from the idea that we're going to expose all the data from our internal database, chuck in the data warehouse, and kind of hope for best and hope our data engineers and other consumers can make use of our data and get value from our data. We want to be a lot more deliberate about the data we're trying to expose, we would decide to expose from our services that we are fighting to be built on, to be consumed. It's how we consider who consume our data. So we really try and bring together the producers and consumers of data, get them talking, get them working out what data they need to meet their requirements, what data can be provided depending on any limitations upstream, really have that conversation a lot more than we're having at the moment. It's how we manage our data, so things like backups and the like. It's how we apply right controls to our data. So we've done things like access controls, things like GDPR, um, compliance, things like that. It's important we have that as well. It's how we lead you the kind of best in class tooling that so me and the other people in the data infrastructure team are providing to business. I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. Essentially, it's, it's how we do data at GoColors from now into future. So that probably sounds a bit abstract. <laughs> it probably sounds like we're doing quite a lot with what is a really simple idea. So what I want to do next is just walk through an example data contract now, I'm not going to go into too much detail in this and how we've implemented data contracts at GoCarlers is very specific to us. So we've been quite lucky to be able to build data contracts on top of our infrastructure platform, which you know, many of you might have or might have the same type of infrastructure platform. So it's very bespoke to us how we built it. So I won't worry too much about how it's implemented. I um, wouldn't necessarily try and copy anything from here. But what I'm hoping to do is by showing you what their contract looks like at GoCarlos, uh, how a bit talk about a bit about how we've implemented it. We kind of make it a bit more real, so add a bit more colour to what I've been talking about. We'll show you how easy that contract to do all those things I've just mentioned and to solve those problems I mentioned right at the start. So this is what a date contract looks like, or kind of the start of a date contract. So a date contract belongs to a service, so um, a service can have one or more date contracts. And I should say, this is implemented or defined in something called JSONnet, which is like JSON, but like with extensions and functions, um, training commas, and things like that. Again, this is, we use JSONnet because that's what infrastructure platform uses throughout. So it's very natural for us to use it. Everyone in GoCartless knows how to use it. Um, again, not necessarily the best way to find schemas to find contracts, but a few of these choice for us. So yeah, a data contract belongs to a service. A service can have many data contracts associated with it, and every data contract has an explicit owner. So really trying to get ownership of data right at the source. And with a data contract, you have a number of field definitions. So we have like a schema. So you have like a name, a type, description. We also have a number of categorization on data. So is it personal data? Is that direct or indirect identifier? Things like that. And it's very important for us to have that in from the start. So try to follow a sort of privacy by design approach. We know from painful experience that like trying to apply categorization to data later, um, and no one really wants to do it. It would be like toil, like busy work, kind of understands why we're doing it. So we want to make sure we've had it from the start. It's a requirement that people categorize their data. Uh, in the tooling we built to use this data of his metadata doesn't exist for a good few months after we introduced data contracts. So that's what full definition looks like in data contracts, a couple of example fields. The next part is a bit that allows them to define what services they want to help them manage that data or what they want to use to expose that data to their consumers. So they want parts of topic, they want a pickery table, they want backups on a table. 
And this is what I, meant when I mentioned earlier about how we can use debt contracts to deploy our debt tooling into business. So we think any tooling we want to build now in the future can be deployed into business using this within the debt contract. So it could be things like a common way to measure and report on SLOs, or it could be maybe we can integrate with Looker and see Looker with some um, sample explorers of the data, like as soon as the data contract is created. So really trying to like, reduce the time to insights from sort of data creation and data contract creation to expose that data in Looker and using that Looker. Maybe we integrate with some reverse ETL tooling if we're producing data designed to be consumed by that tooling. Essentially anything we want to build in the future, we think we can build on top of data contracts by allowing, um, as long as the producers have described the data well enough in their schema, um, and they're likely to find exactly what we want here. But as well as being a convenient way to deploy our tooling, we also, like providing this flexibility, also have to promote autonomy and responsibility and ownership of our data. So what we're not doing is we're saying, like, we're not saying that their schemas have to be a particular shape. They could be really wide, they could be really deep, nested. We don't care, it doesn't matter to us, as long as they describe it well enough. And we're not saying you have to use PubSub, you have to use BigQuery. Um, yeah, what you choose to use depends on how you want private data for consumption. If it's more event-based or more real-time, you pops up. If it's more batch-based or more ETL-like, it's big query. Like, doesn't matter to us. They should use what's best for their data and for their consumers. So we're really trying to promote that autonomy. Like, it's your data. You decide how to model it. You decide how best to provide it. Um, and then you manage it. And you define it in your data contract and you manage it. So it's your data, your autonomy, and that provides me kind of responsibility and ownership of the data as well. Actually, this flexibility has proved quite successful so already so far. So the new further contracts don't use PubSub, so again, more of a batch ETL, so um, use cases. And number contracts don't use BigQuery either. So this is more sort of event-driven or service-to-service communication, less about providing data for analytics or for data science, um, more service to service. What happens, that's all there is in data contract, that's all there is to it. What happens is they define it, they merge it to master or main and git. Um, they do this without any sort of gatekeepers, no central data team reviewing this necessarily. Uh, again, it's their contract. They merge it to, to git and on that merge a number of things happen. So we'll deploy a number of, of we'll have a number of resources in Google Cloud. So pop up topic with a matching schema, a matches contract, a BigQuery table, again, schema matches the contract. And these are de- deployed within um, a producer's own GCP project. So again, promoting that ownership, promoting that autonomy, promoting that responsibility, you know, it's seeing your project, it's your BigQuery table, it's your pop up topic. If you want to give someone access to data, you know, you can change those big permissions and give people access. It's yours, up to you what you do with it. We also deploy a number of Kubernetes services, again, into our own namespace. So um, maybe a service to archive from the of the BigQuery, maybe a service to build data handling and GDPR deletions and things like that. Maybe a service to do replaying from BigQuery, if they need to like recover from instance and things like that. Again, all deployed kind of within the Kubernetes area. So like, these are various services, you know, they get the alerts. Um, we provide them, but like, they get the alerts, they run them. If they need more instances of uh, pubs of BigQuery, they can have more instances. You know, it's up to them. But although kind of all these services and this data has come isolated within a, from a different GCP project, it's not siloed. So we also populate a number of central services, things like data catalog, so you can discover that data no matter where it is. Things like metrics and dashboards and alertings, that's things like the SLOs. And because we're using BigQuery as our data warehouse, although again, this is isolated within GCP resources, but not siloed. With BigQuery, you can query across 
any GT project with no limitations, no penalties. Um, you know, a big a project is more sort of namespace, um, but there's, you can create across it whenever you like. You can save PubSub, you can always tap into PubSub please, no matter what project you're operating. So no matter where the data is, you can still join it together, you can still bring it together, find those insights. So it's not siloed, but it is isolated. Um, again, mainly primarily to promote that sense of ownership and responsibility for the data producers. And what we end up with is a architecture that looks a bit more like this. So compared to the slide I showed earlier, I like a CDC service and a central um, data warehouse where all data went into. And now it's time to get a lot more decentralized, and more like data mesh style, really. Um, many different GSP projects, many different BigQuery areas, many different tables and data sets. And this is how a data contract can provide the interface. So the interface for the data is via BigQuery and PubSub. Um, and these are controlled by the data contract. So always the scheme will match the data contract. You also notice we don't have um, a CTC service anymore. Um, for times where you do need kind of a transactional guarantee with Postgres or with your upstream database before writing it to PubSub or before writing it to BigQuery. You can use things like the outbox pattern, which is something we, we support. And there's other mobile patterns too you can use. So with no need, no longer using CDC. Again, to try and promote us being a lot more deliberate about getting the data from your service and into if a PubSub or BigQuery and making it available for consumption. So that's all I have on the invitation and what example looks like. But really, it's not about the invitation. In my opinion, the most important thing about data contracts um, is not how it's implemented. It's, there's many ways you can implement data contracts. You could use sort of Kafka and a schema registry if you want. You have some sort of central Git repo with Avro definitions or profile definitions. You could use JSON schema, having it live next to the code in the service. Many ways you can do that. Really, it's not that important. What's more important is are you reliant on the problem? And for us, the problem is where we're spending too much time trying to find and understand the data, not enough time actually using the data to provide value. Um, we had no link between what the data producers were doing and how the data was being consumed. And producers had no idea like how the data was being used. So, you know, we're making schema changes to what I thought were their internal models and their internal database. I didn't expect it to be used to define movie numbers and they'd made that change and movie numbers are broken. Or I didn't know they drive, drove some key features for a full model and a full model didn't run to the next day because they, they changed their internal model. I just didn't know, they had no visibility. So the data contracts are really trying to promote that visibility, promote that collaboration between producers and consumers so they know a lot more about what each other are doing. Um, I can work much more closely together on making sure we have the right data available to the right people at the right time. And what we really found was that humans had no confidence in the data. And when we start losing confidence in it, and when we start losing trust in the data, it's very hard to get back. So we wanted to do quite a big change to move away from become unreliable with brittle sort of CC cell pipeline, something we could actually have confidence in, something we can trust. So really, with data contracts, we need to focus on problem we're trying to solve, not on solution, not necessarily trying to copy our JSON net definitions. The problem won't get very far. More important is working out what you're trying to solve, the problem you're trying to solve. Once you've done that, it's about working out how best to solve a problem for you in your organisation. Advice, we spent a lot of time working with people across the organisation, really explaining problems, and really getting a lot of feedback on potential solutions we're looking at. And like one of the things people say data contracts is that like you're asking product teams to do more, obviously they're already busy, like how do you convince them to do that? And for us it wasn't really that hard. Like once you explain the problems to those data producers, to those product teams, and said like, you know, explain to them how unreliable the data problems were and why they were unreliable because we were using the CDC data 
um, which had lack of ownership, lack of documentation, etc. But like, well, yeah, that sounds bad. That's, you know, what can we do to help? And then like, yeah, the, another thing that helped for me sort of explain to people about problems was to use the analogy against an API. And again, like, I would never give access to another service to their internal database and expect that to be okay, expect that to be reliable and to work well. We never do it. So why do I do it for data? And again, explain it to them. It wasn't hard to sell. Yeah, you know, once you understand once you understand the problem, they're, they're quite happy to help. So once we had everyone bought in across the business, we then had to think about our tooling and how we can promote um big kind of decentralized data via the tooling. So the reason why it's all designed the way it is, is really on purpose, really deliberate, to try and promote centralization, try and promote autonomy, and with that you get ownership and responsibility. And then the next step for us is to decommission tooling that no longer meets that vision, but doesn't promote that autonomy. So that includes our CDC, our change that capital tooling, and that pipeline will be decommissioned uh, next year in favor of debt contracts. And really using debt contracts as kind of our vessel to drive culture change at go So we're really demanding that engineering teams deliberately fire the data that we need to consume. And that's a product feature, not a byproduct. We're not just sucking data out of your databases, chucking data warehouse. And when you don't have to think about it anymore, we'll just somehow make it work. Like that doesn't work. We need you know, we have teams, for example, who are responsible for moving money around, uh, sort of updating payment states. Part of their job, part of their responsibility, is to provide us data about those changes in payment states or changes in balances. So we can use that to provide revenue numbers or to provide or to produce features that help us take forward. You know, that's part of our responsibility. We really want to encourage this collaboration between engineers and consumers so they get them to talk to each other. And actually one interesting thing we found was our data consumers, our data scientists, our BI engineers, BI analysts, they really um, struggled in a way to like ask for better data. They're kind of used to just getting what they're given by the CDC services. And then having to do lots of work, lots of logic, and lots of complexity in their pipelines, just try and make, make sense of it and try and get value from it. Like we need to, we're trying to really empower them to say, you know, Go to Bright Seam saying you need this data, it's not good enough quality at the moment. We can't really work with it. It's going to take us a lot of time to just do what we need to do with it. Please produce better data for us. So kind of like a new muscle we have to learn as well. And what we're really trying to do with data contracts or via data contracts is to move us towards a real data-driven organization. One that really values this data and one that uses data to drive business value whether that is via analytics, whether that's via ML-driven models, whatever it is, like we believe we have valuable data and data contracts is a way that we can really get most value from it. So really data contracts, it's less about tooling for us, it's more about driving this culture change. Because ultimately, we strongly believe our data has value and so we guarantee it with a data contract. Cool. Well, thank you very much for, for listening to me today. Um, I hope you found that useful. If you'd like to find out more about data contracts and how we're doing at Go Cardless, I have a few blog posts on my Medium about that. Um, if you want to talk to me about data contracts, I'm always happy to talk about this. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and send me a message. Um, if you want to find out more about Go Cardless, check out our website. Or if you'd like what we're doing at GoCardless, check out Kavir's page as well. Thank you very much. 